Welcome, everybody. I have a guest that I've been looking forward to since I was able to meet him in person at an event that he and some of his partners in crime put on in Las Vegas. Uh, it's probably been about, about a month or so now uh, yeah, ago, I believe, somewhere in that range. Um, so his partners in crime are collectively the behavior panel. So you can find them on YouTube at that channel. And with that, I'm going to let Mr. Greg Hartley introduce himself because he has quite an extensive background. And I'd rather let him give us the highlights than me try to summarize it. So, Greg, tell us a little bit about your background, if you would. Well, first of all, John, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Uh, number one, I started off as a military guy and I joined the Army right out of right out of high school because I couldn't pay for college. Decided, hey, I'll try it. Go get money. Indentured myself for my degree, as I often say. Ended up with a degree as a result of it. But I spent 20 years wandering around the country learning about people and Part of that was as an interrogator, as an Arabic speaking interrogator for the US Army, I taught, I usually do this spiel, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I work most of my time in Wall Street and corporate America, is the way I usually introduce myself. So all that aside, I spent most of 20 years in the Army wandering around the country, living in multiple places, um, interrogating prisoners. I started off, I was in Arlington Cemetery for two years, standing there, great honor, but about year number two, you're standing there going, I think I need a different job from this. Wonderful honor, but not the most intellectually stimulating job. So left there, went to Arabic school for two years in Monterey, California, got paid to sit in language school eight hours a day, one of the best jobs I ever had. Just sit beautiful in area language. too. <laughs> oh yeah, beautiful area, nice spot, expensive, but the army accommodates you, takes good care of you. So not a bad setup, and then off to interrogator school. From interrogator school, I went to resistance training and then became a resistance trainer, teaching people what to do if they're captured. And that's primarily for people like Delta Force, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, Navy or uh, Marine Force Recon, those kinds of guys. We teach them what to do if they're captured. From there, I went off to the first Gulf War, to the Kuwaiti Liberation War uh, with a team, spent time there, left that, came back, became a full-time reservist over time and trained interrogators for the next few years. That's my army history. So in the process of that, all my body language and behavior stuff comes up. And then in 2000, I decided, hey, I think I want to make more money. So I dropped out and took a construction manager job for training the air conditioning company at the time. And I did that for a couple of years and then was tapped to come and run construction management across North America. Did that for a little bit. And as they say, ERPs are the end of careers or the birth of careers. <laughs> I, there was a failed ERP implementation. I got tapped to help drive that to fruition. We did, and then took over operations leadership for all of North America, Canada, US, Mexico, for train, for parts, for new equipment, for construction and for service. Stayed there for a while, and then I wrote that book, Liar. Dropped out, started my own consulting gig for a couple of years. Uh, the economy started to take a tumble. I thought, well, I can do that part-time and go back in full-time. And I became a director of service operations for Train, and then ran a lot of other things for them as a special projects leader when Ingersoll Rand bought us out, often tied into productivity. And so your audience and numbers I get very much because I spent most of my life there. And then went over to Kone Elevator and was a construction leader for that side of the business for about four years and then ran operations for that entire business. I won't go into all those details, but just to give you an idea that I have been in the business world a lot of a lot of my time. And then a few years ago, I started working for a PE advisory firm and work part time for them now a few days a week. I'm an operating partner for them. Great opportunity to see many businesses. And I've got lots of conversation around what you guys do and some funny ones that I'm dealing with right now. So great to meet everybody. And thanks for having me here, John. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for the extensive um, explanation of your background, because I think if people meet you through the behavior panel, like I did, they get probably just a very narrow focus uh, sure. of what you guys focus on, on, on that channel on YouTube. But what fascinated me about that and what intrigued me enough to go to the event was I started to, after watching more and more episodes, I started to see how you guys all would take experience from your previous lives, previous jobs, and sort of, you did a really good job of translating that to different contexts where people that had no interest in being an interrogator or any kind of military interest still could get value out of what you guys were talking about. And so that's that's kind of what my focus has been on all the material that I've consumed. Uh, the books of you guys, this is one of the ones, one of, another one of your books. My first, um, yep. This is your first one. So yep. I got a hold, I could not find this one on Amazon. Um, I had to hunt this one down, but I don't know if you can see there's a little glare on there. How to be an expert yep. in anything in two hours. 
So that is of great interest to me. So we might talk about that maybe offline because that could Love be a to. whole separate yeah. conversation. Um, but the audience that I work with and that most likely will be tuning into this are primarily accounting and finance professionals, right? So for those sure. of you who are not accounting and finance professionals, don't have a military uh, background, you said a few things that I wanted to make sure that we clarified uh, for some folks, because we, we have a habit of falling into acronyms and, and lingo. You mentioned you went over over in the first Iraq war with a team. Do you mean a special forces team? Yeah. So okay. I was lucky. I was working at the resistance school and actually had to volunteer and volunteer and volunteer because we were exempt from deployment. And I'm not that guy. I was one of 55 Arabic speaking interrogators and thought, what the hell are you doing leaving me here? Yeah. So I kept kept going and going until they brought me over. And I was started off with the back at the headquarters and the guy who was the group commander, group being like a brigade, guy in charge of an entire group, fifth group, fifth special forces group said to me, just keep moving forward as far as you want to go. And when you're done, just say, hey, I'll stop here. And I just kept okay. saying, I want to move forward. I want to move forward. So I ended up with a with an ODA, an operational detachment alpha, what we call an A-team for part of the war. And then for after the war on the ground for several weeks. So yeah, okay, a, a, an A-team, Green Beret team. Yeah. So for, uh, for all you accountants out there, I'm sure when he said ERP, you know exactly what he's talking about. For those of you who are not in accounting, enterprise resource planning, it's a big software package that's most of the time purports to kind of handle all of the software for, for the whole company, right? For the whole right. enterprise. Um, and in my experience, it, I have this opinion of everything that are like combos, they tend to be not the best in any area because they're True. trying to be pretty good at a lot of different things, which is very difficult to do. Uh, and then you mentioned a PE advisory firm, so private equity um, for for the non non financial accounting folks out there, go ahead. You were going to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to say actually the first thing that I was deploying that failed, and we, I got asked to help was not an ERP. It was an EIA to be technical. It was more of a best of breed cobbled together, which is harder to do. But once it's together, much more effective. I agree with you. SAP and those large Oracle, those large players, are all things to all people. This was a best of breed approach. Brilliant when it was finished, but my God, it took a lot to get it in. Yeah, back in the mid '90s, uh, a buddy of mine that I used to work with were we were trying to we wanted to break off and do consulting in PeopleSoft implementations, mm -hmm. and we realized to get PeopleSoft certified, you had to have a certain number of hours doing implementations, and the only way you could do that is working for someone else. It was like this chicken and egg thing. So we figured have to go to work for somebody else, and ended up not going down that road. But um, you had mentioned Monterey, and you said you were in the Army, so I'm assuming that was at Fort Ord. Uh, well, the Presidio is actually a separate oh, division. Okay. And I, I think the leadership was seated, seated in Ord before Ord went away. Uh, and okay. I, I had horses at the time. I kept my horses over there. But yeah, I was in the Presidio of Monterey. It's actually on the peninsula out in the middle of, I mean, it, the, some of the real estate there, if they sold it, they could settle part of the deficit right now because it's the best yeah, it's view beautiful. in the city. Yeah. It's the best view in the city too. Yeah, Fort Ord was, was my dad's last duty station, uh, last duty station in the U.S. before he retired. So what year? I was... Um, let's see, I would have been in like fourth, fifth grade. Okay. Yeah. Um, so late seventies, mid, mid to late seventies, yeah, yeah. I guess. I was there late eighties and, and Fort Ord was still open, but they closed Ord not long after. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so we have a little bit of your background. I want to kind of rewind a little bit and get a little bit of a picture. Um, so I, I like frameworks. I know you guys do also. That's one of the other things that, that being that accounting background, we like structure sure, and, sure. and those types yeah. of things. So one of the acronyms that I use when I talk about communication is CLEAR, and the C in CLEAR is context. So I like to get a little bit of context on whoever it is that we're talking to. Tell me a little bit about how, how big was the town that you grew up in? So I grew up in a town, now I think it's around 200,000 people, uh, partnered okay. with a place across the river. If you've ever been to Fort Benning, that's my hometown. And okay. if, if you were there, right across the river is another small town of about 65,000. So not a small town. But okay. I, they always would refer to it as the world's largest country town, just kind of backward okay. little. <laughs> and so all for, the people and none of the benefit, right? And so for contrast, how big is the city or town that you live in now? Well, I live on the edge of Atlanta. So take Atlanta, okay. for example, 10 and a half million people in, the, in, in Georgia. And I think 7 million of that's in the metro area. So big sprawling mess, lots of advantage, lots of disadvantage to it. So, yeah. so what would you say is the biggest difference in, in those two types of areas, it's a smaller, not small town, but smaller to a pretty big city. 
Well, there are two things. I, I grew up in a town that was primarily a military base with lots mm -hmm. of other little ancillary businesses. So I, I was saying this to a person I met a few days ago who is from 20 minutes from me and has a really heavy Southern accent. He said, I understand why you don't have it. You grew up near a military base. All my friends well, were the, the children of people who had been all over the world. You, you're a military guy yourself, you know. Yeah. So for example, one of my best friends in high school was just here this weekend, Japanese mother, Italian father, uh, Korean friends, German friends, lots of people who came over and you know, lots of war brides after World War II. So the whole culture is very different there than even Atlanta. Atlanta's pockets of that, or the Atlanta metro area, there are pockets of that, but not as it's not as multicultural unless you go in and seek it out. Whereas when I was in high school, I was going to school with people from lots of different cultures and it changed the way you think, changed the way you speak, all of those pieces. So yeah, I think now yeah. I have lived, to be fair, I have lived in very large city in the edge of very large cities, lived in the edge of Philly for seven years and then lived in very small places. And I think the difference is how well people know each other, how much interaction they have and how much baseline. You'll hear me talk a lot about baselining a person. What's their normal behavior, speech patterns, cadence. I usually go in, in four parts. I talk about vocal and verbal and nonverbal. So vocal being the piece where we're talking about your your tone, pitch, and cadence. When we talk about verbal, we're talking about your choice of words. Those are going to be more common, more alike in a very small town because people have speech patterns that have developed there, unless it has a lot of, a lot of migration, Fort Benning. On the other hand, if you're in a very large group, there may be many pockets of that. I think in New York, and you can go into a neighborhood where there are very specific baselines for the way people talk, how much they use their hands, their choice of words, their cadence, pitch, tone, all of those pieces. So I think it's variable in terms of the way people think, the way people mm -hmm. talk. And now this, the internet, is changing everything. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, this has been a blessing and a curse, I think. For sure, for sure, um, I agree with you. And so, so one of the questions that I get, I get a few questions all the time that I think might be right up your alley to maybe share some of your, your knowledge and experience. So one of them is something you just touched on when we're in the virtual world, you talk a lot about body language and, and reading behavior. And one of the biggest challenges I see, especially when we're doing virtual training, is a lot of times people won't turn their cameras on. And so you can't even, even if you're trying to be very diligent and, you know, kind of trying to pay attention to everyone, you kind of lose that. So I'm wondering if you have any tips uh, or things that maybe just have worked for you if you're in like group virtual meetings that, that might be helpful. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you're, you need to talk to individuals. We, if you ever notice, and we're doing the behavior panel, we intentionally say you, not you all, not everyone. We are talking to the person. It's the same thing yes. as standing in front of a very large audience, though. If you're talking, if you're standing in front of 100 to 500 people, and you can't engage the individual by paying attention to every person at a different time, you'll lose them. And I think sometimes having activities, especially if you're the leader, having activities that force people to interact is good because it means that they'll be on their toes and paying attention. Years ago, when I was rolling out a system, we had this two-way camera stuff. I was working for Train, and we had this guy named, we call him Trainer Dave, and he was a great financial trainer and systems trainer. And he would come on and he would say, okay, I, I can't hear you think, so I need to see your heads nod like dogs in the window. And that became kind of his trademark, dogs in the window. So you think of that, okay. he's talking about a little dog on the dash in the window. So if you, if you think of that, finding your own way of branding, your own way of connecting so that people feel connected and project that back to you and you can see it from them one way or another. That's okay. probably the most That's powerful great. one. So one of the other things that I think I get a lot of questions on, and it's still probably one of my biggest areas for improvement is listening skills. Even just now, just being totally transparent, as you were talking, I, I had thoughts running through my head about a, a sure. next question, maybe a next question, right? And I, I find that when I started learning on trying to be a better listener, it was way harder than I realized it would be. As an interrogator for all those years, wh what are some of the things that, that you learn that are like tactical, practical skills to actually become a better listener? Well, I, I think the first one is our intellectual curiosity has to be the number one thing driving us. You met Jim Pyle recently. I say Jim is, has the mm -hmm. curiosity of a five-year-old, and he's much older than that. I've known Jim for 40 years. And so when you think through how people are speaking, once you learn that what matters is pitch, tone, and cadence in, in their, in their nonverbals or in their vocals, then you're listening for stress and strain. When we interrogate prisoners, we are after information and we have something we want to know. Now, we don't project, 
in, in criminal investigation, we're trying to get to the bottom of a confession or maybe just get information. But in an intelligence interrogation, we're trying to discover what we don't know. And we have a list of things we want to know. And if we're not careful, those are the questions we'll ask, even though the person brings up another topic. The way a person stresses something with their voice, you hear pitch change, you hear tone change, you hear cadence change, is the most powerful thing you can learn. It, it, that, that series of things are the most important things you can learn about listening. Because a person doesn't arbitrarily change tones. It means something. Something's changed in their head. Their pitch doesn't change unless they're trying to make a point or their body is overruling their brain and their fight or flight is kicking in and that drying of the vocal cords causes that. You can do that vocal fry when I force my voice. So listening for that, make it a game. I always tell people when you're looking out, when you're trying to learn anything about body language and behavior, make it a game. The first thing you should do is pick one of those topics and start trying to spot it. You don't have to do it with people you're talking to today. Turn on the news and make jot down notes and identify those things so that it becomes a game for you. And after a while, it's not a game anymore. It just jumps off the plate. So you, your active listening is instinctive then rather than intentional. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when I talked to Jim, he actually, he emphasized curiosity as well. And he turned yeah. me on to that Brian Grazier book, A Curious Mind, yep. which I probably read two chapters without like, I didn't want to put it down. I was right. literally on my elliptical going, I'll just do another 10 minutes because I just didn't want to stop reading the book. <laughs> he talks so much about curiosity. Um, and he talks about making it a game as well. And it reminded me, I had done it accidentally because I think I'd heard you guys say that multiple times before. I was at the grocery store and I, I used an elicitation statement without even thinking about it. I just said something about the way that you, you cashier, all of you guys here, you check people out so fast, you must get a lot of training. And he started volunteering stuff about their training <laughs> program and the fact that they time them and blah, blah, blah. And I, I walked out yeah. and I thought, oh, wait, I didn't even realize I was doing that. So to your point, I, I guess I had made it a game because I'm just naturally curious and it was fun. And then boom, all of a sudden, I started seeing results from it, even though I didn't really have an end goal in mind. Um, well, yeah, and that's just, the best way. If you have an end goal, you, you'll project sometimes and get to that point that you wanted by digging for information and forcing the picture. But if you have no idea what you're going to collect, if you just know you're going to collect, and I'll give you a great example. When I was teaching younger interrogators, they have an intent. They go in, they want to know about weapon systems of some kind in a location. Great example in the Middle East. They're after chemical weapons so hard that they forget to pay attention to other things like like biological weapons maybe, but more like delivery systems and those pieces that are just as vital because we get so focused, you know, you, they always say, and if you're not interested in the intelligence stuff still, in your daily job, in your everyday life, there are things that matter that you overlook every day because you're too busy looking for the thing you want. And you may find, and you know, I always say the world is like a sweater. You start pulling, it's all tied together. Uh, and you may find that when you get that first piece, you find a lateral path to getting to truth about what's going on. I do it all the time in, yeah. in corporate America. I, I deal with PE companies. I go in and talk to them. I had one last week where I was asking questions and they said, well, we got a finance problem. And I said, really? What's your finance problem? Well, collections, that's not a finance problem. That's a business problem that finance owns. Now you got to figure out. And once you start asking questions, you realize that, hey, we're not getting the right data back from our people in the field. We're not putting it into these third party systems in a timely fashion. That's not a finance problem. That's an operations problem. Yeah. But you have to listen to what people are saying because you'll miss it otherwise. So that actually brings up a, gr a great point, which is um, I talk in some of my trainings about presenting numeric information. And mm -hmm. I specifically word it as presenting numeric information because it's not always financial. Right. And finance right. and accounting people, we, we just sometimes we just throw around the word financial information. And lots of times we might be talking about ratios or metrics that are really right. operational, like, like yep. an accounts receivable turnover. That's not not really a financial number, if you think That's about right. it. That's right. Um, and one of the things that I think really helped broaden my horizons when I was still working for big companies in, in corporate finance was the ability to kind of get out in the field uh, and work more with the people in operations. It's something I encourage people in finance and accounting to do all the time um, that I think has improved. It, has it been your experience, if you look back, let's say 20 years ago compared to today, in your experience, are finance and accounting people in general getting a broader exposure to the business than they would have 20 years ago? 
Yeah, I think the company depends. It depends on the company, of course. Yeah. But yes, for sure. I, probably 15 years ago, I worked with a guy named Ben Rickers, who's since retired, who was our, our controller for the and, and CFO for the small portion of the business. Small is relative billion size, a billion dollar business, but a small portion of the overall business. And he would always say, look, there's no such thing as finance without operations. And I would say, or, or vice versa, because it's a partnership. Yeah. And he was the most operational guy I ever knew in finance. But I see more people getting out there. For, from, from me, and I've been the vice president of operations for a $2 billion company. And so what I always try to get people to understand is voodoo math matters. And what I mean by voodoo math <laughs> is not talking in hardcore financial terms, but putting it in ratios and numbers and, and any kind of system you can help people understand. For example, yeah. if I say, hey, we need $2 million in savings this year, then I'll say that's this many FTE, that's this many people, you know, we take out that many people, that's not savings. But it gets the point across that we need to find that much work that people are doing that's stupid to fix the problem. So for example, I'll often talk about you know, 2,000 labor hours a year, and if I'm gonna get $2 million, is $1,000, you know, and we're paying them $100, that's 10 folks gone. So we look at those numbers pretty quickly and think about how do we better make it work. And if you can talk to people in the field in terms they understand, like labor hours, applied time, those kinds of things, their heads will get it and they'll anchor it much better. Because the formulaic things we think about from a, from a finance point of view, don't land with most operations people. They don't understand it the same way. So you said something that jumped out at me, which maybe the accountants will, will get this, but you said 2,000 hours. Yeah. So 20 years ago, when I was the guy actually creating the budgets, we always used 2,080 hours as a standard yep. work year. So have, have we just trimmed back the number of hours per year that most people are working or were you just rounding for simplicity? Yeah, I'm just rounding. Yeah, 2,080 okay. is the standard number. But if we think okay. about it, that 80 hours of that are paid for nothing. Usually it's two, it's two <laughs> weeks of vacation, so there's no productivity gain there. But if I can figure right. a way, a great example, when I worked for Train, long before these things came out, in 2007, I deployed a paperless system for service tax. Pretty quickly, you have to figure out a math formula for how that's going to work. Well, how do you do that? <laughs> and I called it voodoo math then even. And I would say, look, if I can take the total number of tax I have times the base labor we're paying them, and I can reduce X number of minutes per day, minutes per day of waste. And these guys were, mm -hmm. they were printing off things in their vehicle, having it signed and going home and faxing it back, spending 40 minutes a day of non-productive. That's waste. That is just waste yeah. by anybody's standard. If I can do that, I can take $7 million out of, out of the budget, uh, out of the spin that we're putting into this, into this business every day. And I can pay for a lot of junk with seven million dollars and sure enough what we did was before there were smartphones they had this thing called a motorola we called it the brick it was a motorola system and we put everything into that system and we pushed all that data back into a database back into the erp and we ran ai against it so we could start long before there was real ai we were the redneck ai version it was it was <laughs> nothing more than a database it was looking for trends by model and serial number and That's when you can explain to somebody here's seven million dollars in waste lying around I can go get this, but you have to explain it to them in a way they understand. And I came up with minutes. The problem and the danger with using voodoo math is the next thing you know, people who don't understand what you're doing are using it as if it's gospel. So they're like, well, I can save 12 minutes here. I don't think you understand what we're trying to do there. But using numbers in a way that are meaningful to people is the same thing as when you're interrogating someone and you're talking to them in their language and you shift gears and start speaking like they speak rather than you know, way up here somewhere, way down there somewhere, trying to get as close to the, the way they speak as you can. In my world, in body language and behavior, we would call that mirroring. How do I mm -hmm. speak more like you? Pitch, tone, and cadence, choice of words and everything. Right. Yeah, you said something there that um, reminded me of how people sometimes fall into using like assessments, right? The gospel, you said something, people take it as gospel, right? Somebody takes yep. a DISC assessment and we have this big meeting and everybody oh, yeah. reviews their disc styles and we talk about it and how we can use it and all this. And then all of a sudden down the road, people start falling into stereotyping. Oh, that guy's a D. He's so strong willed and blah, blah, blah. And then they sort of project all the yes. stereotypical characteristics onto them. So that it, I think a lot of these things, the big difference between generalizations and, and stereotypes, right? I look at generalizations as super helpful as a starting point to start understanding people. But then you got to look at every single person as an individual and, you know, how much of that group set of characteristics actually is true of that particular person. Yeah, yeah. and so. I would say this. People are, you hear me say this over and over and over at our live event. I know you heard me say people are on the bell curve. We're going to generalize. We're going to talk about the people in the center. They're people who are ex 
extraordinary and people who aren't. I have my own word for those folks. But in the middle is, is the lion's share of people. And that lion's share of people are going to have some commonality. Any of these tools, any of these tools we talk about, any modeling, I have my own in my business book, uh, the most dangerous business book you'll ever read. I have my own version based on how people help, whether they're forced to help, want to help, volunteer their help, all those kinds of things. But that's a sorting tool. It's a way to talk about people in meaningful moments in a way that is meaningful at the moment you're looking for something. Mark Bowden, one of my partners on the behavior panel, always says all models are wrong, some are just useful. That's yeah. the way you to look at it. So th something that all of you on the behavior panel, I think do really well, which I think is a big part of why you've got, your following has gotten so big, is you're very good at, even sometimes without telling people that you're doing it, using certain tools or frameworks like uh, analogies, stories, um, acronyms, things like that. Um, are those things that you just kind of learned on the job along the way? Or did you get any kind of formal training in any of those like storytelling and any of that stuff? Or was that more just experience? Yeah, I think it's more just along the way. We learn in different ways. Each of us has our own style. Like, uh, for example, Mark was an actor. You know, Scott was a music, a music guy. He was in music production. Chase just left the military and I've been in a little bit of everywhere. So we bring a different angle in the storytelling and all of those pieces. We do have models. You heard me talk about read, for mine, review, evaluate, analyze, and decide. Mm -hmm. Mark has scan. Scott has his own. Each of us have our own models and acronyms to make things easier. And I'm the first guy to tell you, I quote an old friend who was my last active army boss. In the intel business, we're kind of the redheaded stepchildren of intelligence. We don't have equipment. All we need is a, a sandy beach and a sharp stick to be able to do our <laughs> job. We need to ask questions or write down what you say. That's it. So what we need the ability to do is to make it portable because I'll talk a lot about stress brain and cat brain or whatever you want to call it. When you're under so much stress, you can't think. I needed to teach people in a way that they could remember. And when I was a trainer, if you can't give people a set of mnemonic devices or acronyms or something, they can't, it doesn't stick with them. They have to think, if they're thinking yeah. academically when they're standing face to face with the enemy, li quite literally, it's yeah. hard. So I came up with things like, you know, gesture, il illustrator, regulator, adapter, barrier, so that it sticks in people's head. Yeah, Necessity. I think, I think accounting and finance folks, especially we're, we're, we're lovers of frameworks and structures. And um, I know yeah. in my accounting education, that was a big deal, especially when we were studying for any kind of exam, much less a CPA exam. Um, so I, I think that's something that, that finance and accounting folks are probably used to quite a bit. Uh, I was just curious when I talk about storytelling to that crowd, it, it seems to be kind of a new concept to them in the, in the context of work, right? So I, I even have had, had to have conversations sometimes with their training folks, almost to sell them on the idea that storytelling actually is super useful and, you know, and really benefit, uh, these teams. And then, you know, once they finally get into it, obviously they, they see more, um, more value in it. I'm curious, it sounded like when you were talking about uh, deciding to go into the military, it doesn't sound like that was something that you weren't like the kid. Like I hear a lot of these, these uh, former special forces or Navy SEAL guys, like when I was five years old, I saw Charlie Sheen on TV in a movie or whatever. And ever since then, I wanted to be that. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Well, it's funny that you say that because I would have loved to have been a fighter pilot would have been my number one thing, not because I'd watch movies about it, but because it looked like really cool, really fun stuff. But you have to have money to pay for college and all that. And I was very practical in that. In, in terms of was I ever really in the military? Sure. I mean, I joined ROTC when I was 14, played Army all the time. My summer camps were shooting like you could go to uh, Fort Benning. <laughs> I always laugh about this. I was on a shooting team at 14 shooting at school. We had a rifle range downstairs and then go to Fort Benning in the summer and we fired him 60 machine guns and all that. So I was hooked on that part of it for sure. I just wanted to be an officer because I knew that was a step out of where I was, you know, and my family was yeah. pretty poor and, you know, work, work hardworking people all their lives. And I wanted a lever to get to the next step. So being an officer would have been that that didn't work out. So I joined the army. The funny part is I joined the army, came back out. I started college and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go to engineering or accounting or something because I have a good numbers brain. Started, gave it a shot, hated college, went right back in the army um, <laughs> and spent the next uh, X number of years and finished my degree there. And it ended up with high concentrations in language and psychology because of what I do. And honestly, I could not have chosen better. I still am good with numbers. And I always say, you've heard me talk about pile. I say the same thing about all of us. We're just pearls that keep laying down layers. My first job in the army, I was 18 years old. 
I walk in and I was working in a processing center and there was a young captain there who was trying to stand in front of a crowd and present this form. And he said, you're pretty gregarious. Why don't you try this? And I walked in front of like 500 people, <laughs> da, 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 did my thing, walked off stage and he said, that's your job. From now on, that's your job. So that gave me that skill set. So you use the word gregarious. Do you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert? Just out of the box, just naturally. Very, very much an extrovert. You extrovert. probably don't see it as much, uh, but because I, on the show, you know, I'm very contained. <laughs> Sitting, waiting. That's my interrogator face. Well, I was going to say, I'm, the job you did for so long. Uh, right. But I'm very much a people person because every person yeah. I meet knows something I don't know. And I want to know it. You just hit on the question uh, at the event. Uh, one of the days Jim Pyle was at, at the table I was sitting at um, and it was just like first come first or just sit wherever you want to sit. Right. Yep. He was sitting across from me and I just said, good morning. And he said, good morning. Um, what's something, t- what's something that you, you know, that I don't know, that I wouldn't know if I didn't ask you, I'm paraphrasing. I might've got it wrong. Yeah. Well, Jim's always got a long line of words, He's- <laughs> but it, it's, st- I'm assuming he, he was trying to break my pattern or maybe that's just something he does. I don't know, but, he said it and it stopped me in my tracks because I think most people, I'll speak for myself, I think I am conditioned to kind of listen for that short, kind of normal, just polite question. How you doing? What's up? How's it going? And then when he hit me with that, I thought, oh, crap, you're making me think. <laughs> and I had to stop and actually break it down and think. And the only thing I could come up with is, I don't know. And then he said something else and I was so stuck. I was so out of that pattern of just that expecting certain things. It gets back to the listening thing, right? Yep. yep. I was kind of listening and thinking, okay, what am I going to say? I almost had it like ready to go. So one of three things. So I was going to be one of these three things. It wasn't one of those three things. Um, yeah. And I think we, we are so conditioned. I, I live in the South, have lived here a good portion of my life. You know, I always say about half, well, a little more than half of it now. Grew up here, left, came back. So where you when you live in the south there's a certain amount of pleasantry you're going to do you know other parts of the country i work in new york all the time no eye contact moving along it's just it depends on where you're at as to how you approach yeah. people the powerful thing about elicitation when, when we talk about elicitation there are nine techniques in general that people use and it's a way to get information without asking a question more yeah. setting the person up to go the next step the powerful thing about that is to let the person talk. And what Jim's trying to do is get you started talking and then he can nudge you along the way as you, as you move and change the conversation with, with questions and redirects and that kind of thing so that you start talking about something he doesn't know anything about. And that's the power. That's the power in what we do collectively that we call intelligence gathering, whether the human skills from interrogation and from elicitation and from all the other things that we picked up. Yeah, you reminded me of Jim. Jim emphasized his use of what else. And I was yep, thinking about that. You were, you were saying something earlier that reminded me of that too, is that waiting to get kind of get the whole breadth of information at a high level before you start diving down into the details. That sort of was kind of my summary of, of that takeaway. They give you one answer. Don't start drilling deep right. on that one thing until you find out a little bit more about the bigger picture. Uh, so, so John, there, there are two schools of thought. When it comes to interrogation, for example, intelligence collection, which is really, guys, when, interrogation has an ugly name in any business you go to, any world you go to. In, in those languages, in Arabic, the word is not a bad word. It means truth getter, but it has such an ugly connotation because of what people have done in the past. But mm-hmm. what we're really after is how much information can I gather in a short period of time in a way that is meaningful and truthful. That really is what we're after. And that's useful in everyday life. But when when... When you're talking about interrogators, there are two schools of thought. One that's methodical and will go down the rabbit hole and come back up and go down the rabbit hole and come back up. And the other is the Columbo mode. Most of us are big Columbo fans. Scatter, 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 scatter. And always thinking about that scatter as a spider web. And how do I weave mm. this back to that with other questions later? So you've got you to be on the ball to use that method, but it's the most powerful yeah. method. Yeah. Just one more thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Columbo. Exactly. One more question. So on, on elicitation, how, how, talk a little bit, if you would, about how you would use elicitation in a business context. Like say, say I'm working in a, a planning department, right? And I work on budgets all day. For sure, I'm dealing with lots of different departments. And especially in the context of budgets, as one example, or maybe someone's putting in some type of uh, a request for capital, right? 
And so we have to go into information gathering mode. For sure. What are, what are some ways elicitation might play into that to make that a more effective interaction? Well, the single most important part of elicitation is the, is the funnel or is the hourglass. And that's it's important that when you're talking to people, you always spend that few extra seconds, even if it's not in your DNA, to build rapport. And by that, we mean let's start broad and talk about things that have nothing to do with what we want. So, John, how was your, how was your commute here today? Oh, awful. Yeah, I don't know how much fuel I set. I burned sitting. Well, you know, then they're giving you a lead already because now I might want to know how much fuel they plan to spend for their team for next year. I, I loop back to Ooh. that rapport building. Humans lead what creates pain. And pain points, if you're a salesperson, you know Sandler or any of those things talk about finding pain. Body language can show you pain. And your people working in finance or in accounting, if you notice a person looking down into their right, it's one of the damn near absolutes in body language. Usually that's associated with emotion. And if a person's here thinking and talking about something, they're feeling something about it. But in that broad talking about life in general, how'd you get here? How long did it take? That kind of thing. You pick up leads, but you also are endearing yourself to the person and opening channels of communication. You're building rapport, if you will. And rapport gives that person to feel safer talking to you rather than you're you're being an interrogator and trying to drag information out of them. Even interrogation includes a rapport building phase, then it's down to approaches or psychological ploys and then to intelligence gathering. So once you get through that information, you get what you want, you know how much money he's gonna spend on his budget for fuel next year, and you're trying to figure out whether it's rational or not, you wanna broaden back out and say, yeah, well, well the fuel is gonna be a, a problem for all of us, but it's good to hedge, it's good to be prepared and it's good for this, this and this. What will be the impact? You get where I'm headed is that's the most important part. Yeah. And then there are nine ploys and it includes things like provocative statement, like you said. You know, I could say, I don't know how any of us are gonna make it if fuel prices keep going up. That might force him to give you his fears for next year, what's coming, her fears for next year, what's coming. So it's a powerful set of tools. And you might say it's manipulation. It isn't, it's controlling conversation. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I think that I think the, the language on that bothers people sometimes. Even if you say controlling conversation to some people. Jim mentioned something about one of his book titles. He didn't really love the book title because it sounds to some people like you're trying to control things, right. which I guess in an interrogator mode, that, that would make sense. But in in the context of accounting and finance, that makes sense too, especially if we're talking about budgets and I have to keep you on tasks that, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges I used to have is when I was young, I was in my early to mid twenties and I was having to sit down with department VPs and basically tell them because we had a top-down budget, right? Hey, this is your budget, right? Because the CFO right. said so. I'm just the messenger, but I have to work with you to figure <laughs> out the details of how to get there, right? And so I think that's part of where I started to figure out. I got to get good at communicating because these guys are up here on the the hierarchy and I'm down here. So you got to be very careful about how you question and ask for things and and tell things that are are just the way it's going to be. But you can't really tell someone that's higher up in the organization than you are that this is the way it's going to be. Um, yeah. So, well, and that's the don't shoot the messenger story, right? We do that all the time. And, and remember, when you're interrogating people, we play lots of different roles. I may play the good guy or the bad guy. I often say I have the stoic looking face, which makes me a really good bad guy. And then if you have somebody who looks softer and friendlier, they get to play the good guy. I, people are always amazed that I'm actually friendly when I meet them and talk to them because they see me on the show and I'm so, and, but I try to always remind people through sense of humor. Yeah, I have a sense of humor about things. I just, this is the person you need me to be in this role. When I, when I work corporate America, I, I, folk, I make everything as folksy as I possibly can because people can relate to that. They may think you're kind of a hillbilly or that kind of thing. One of the guys that I worked with for many years, senior vice president in an elevator company said, that folksy cover you have disarms people all the time. By the yeah, the word disarm actually is exactly what I was thinking. It's disarm. And that's what you're after. Is you need to disarm the person from feeling like you're the bad guy. Sometimes you are the bad guy. Sometimes you came up with the problem and you need to solve it. But they also need to realize that it's a role. It's not me as a person, especially when you're in a fiduciary role or those kinds of situations. You have to be the guy who is standing in the door. And it's not always your, your fault, but it's always your job. And that's hard for yeah. people to get their head around. Sometimes. That was something when, when I was in that role, when I got a little better at it, it made me feel good when someone who didn't get a project approved still was like, hey, man, I appreciate your help. You yeah. know, I, yeah, I, know you, I know you did your best to present it and, you know, you were trying to help us out and everything, which I wasn't really trying to help them as much as I was trying to be Switzerland on the whole thing. Right. Like, right. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. really have a dog in the fight. Kind of like you guys say, 
when, you, when you're breaking down the videos, we don't care, right? If they're guilty, if they're innocent, we're just That's telling right. you what we see. Look, I, I say this often on the show, but I taught all lettered agencies and Gitmo shift leaders and all that over the years and taught them about interrogation, advanced interrogation psychology and that kind of thing and body language and behavior. And I'd always say, if you can't understand the genius of something that criminal did, I used 9-11, for example, while aberrant and horrific thing, if you can't understand the genius and what they carried out, you can't talk to the guy. So you have to be able to understand where they're coming from when they're pitching the project, even if you don't agree with it. And we are the same way. If you heard us talk about Bundy and those guys, typically we're the same way with all those guys. He's a defective yeah. toy. Something's wrong. Boom, boom, boom. And it, on the other hand, a lot of these people, we don't know whether they're telling the truth or not. We, we are better if we control a conversation. We're much better than average at getting the truth. If we don't control the conversation, we're about 60 percent and you're about 50. That's the interesting piece. Body language is not magical. Yeah. All the tools together are powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard Chase uh, say something about um, some interrogator. It was kind of a generic example. He gave some interrogator that took like hours to get a piece of information out of the guy. And then he comes out and he brags and he's like, I got it out of him in only two hours. And Chase was like, well, that's because you stumbled on the one thing that right. you actually needed to either build rapport or gain the trust or, yep. or you finally saw the thing that you needed to you know, sort of adjust the question or the elicitation or whatever it was. Whereas you guys, because of your knowledge and your experience, you kind of cut right, right to that. Um, yeah. And, and I would, add, I would add to that, John. Uh, yes, it depends if you control the conversation, but you know, Jung said no two people are the same after they interface because we're like chemical reagents. We change each other. I, and my analogy to that, you know, I always use analogies, as you said, is I'm like Jane Goodall among the chimps, observing the chimps, except I'm also a chimp, so I'm affected by their behavior. And that's the hardest part for you to get good at. And I think it gets easier with age. One of the best things about aging as an Intel guy is you get much more subtle and nuanced in your approach. When you're young, you know, you understand it the way you understand it. But when I was 25 and my brain flooded in testosterone, I was probably a little different than I am at 60. 60, you're a little more calm, a little more patient, waited out a little bit longer instead of being as certain with low risk. You, you, when you're this age, your risk profile is much different than when you're 25 and going off to war. Yeah. So it changes things. Yeah, it makes sense. You said something earlier too that, that uh, reminded me of something that's been a struggle for the longest time for me. You said something about that people think you have a very stoic face and then when they meet you in person, they, they see, oh, you're, you know, you're actually nice and outgoing and all that. Um, I, I've heard people talk about the fact that some people physiologically have the resting B face, right? I'm, I'm one of those, <laughs> yeah, right? So my nice. girlfriend is forever getting on my case about pictures. It's like, why aren't you, why aren't you smiling these pictures? Aren't you happy? I'm like, yes, yeah, we'll tell your face, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do, <laughs> do you have any tips for people on, and not necessarily just for taking picture, family pictures, but when we go into right. a meeting, I've had two different bosses pull me aside after meetings and go, dude, you can't do that. Like, do what? What are you talking about? I didn't hardly said anything. It was your face. What are you talking? He basically said, you wear your heart on your sleeve, which I wasn't even aware of it. Right. And it got well, me into and, trouble. And part of this is to not have that. This is a, re a well rehearsed, no, no expression face when I'm interrog when I interrogated prisoners. Just listening, just listening. Now, the shape of my face, you'd read into that whatever you want and all that that goes with it. No hair and all that changes your impression when you first meet me. But what you have to do is see what impact you're having on other people. So, for example, if I want people to know I'm friendly, I'm warm, I raise my brow and I look at them, remembering that raising your brow alone is a signal. It's saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm interested. And if I raise my brow and I listen and I tilt my head, it, even if my face looks flat, it sends the impression I'm intaking information, I'm, I nod, I'm paying attention, and I'm agreeing, and I'm, you know, I, I care what you say. Even if I don't care what you say, mm -hmm. I may do that to get you to talk. But that's because we do data intake, and we're, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. You use your face to show, ex to show expression. I'm not going to smile, big toothy smile, because that would look even more disturbing for people that know me. <laughs> that, see, that's what I've done in the past, yeah. is I've thought, okay, this is what almost... Oh, this probably sounds terrible, but almost like I've heard you guys describe psychopaths. They they see a behavior and they go, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And then they that. kind of practice it. Right. Yep. And it, but it looks like it. Right. You look like a psycho when you do that. T tell me what give me your thoughts on this. I came up with an idea that it worked for a while and then it, I think it stopped working. I'm not sure why. I thought I noticed every time somebody caught me in a picture when I was laughing, I was always smiling. 
that genuine Duchesne smile. Yep. So yep. I thought, what if I were to tr- just try to think of something funny when I, whenever I know someone's going to take a picture? And so I thought of, I don't know if you ever watched the TV show Friends, but oh, yeah. Once, I always thought it was funny when Joey would go, how you do it, right? I thought it was cheesy and it always made me laugh. Right. So I, for the longest time, I would say either out loud or just silently in my head, how you do it, right before a picture. And for a while it worked great. And then it seems like it wore off. I mean, what do, do you think? Well, humor it's is a that novelty? way. If, well, I think humor is that way too. The more you use a specific joke or one liner, you, you, you get inoculated to it and it doesn't work. So you probably okay. have to shift gears and have something else funny because mo- okay. it's the same problem all of us have when we, if you, the four of us in a room and we're watching people, we've seen every facial expression there is so many times. And we've seen how people string together behaviors and facial expressions that when someone's lying to us, we're like, oh, how cute. And it, <laughs> it's just fun to what we're doing one next week. We were doing some this week. We had a, a little bit of a, a batch, a, a little bit of a problem, but we've got one coming up that you guys are really going to appreciate. It's one of the worst lies I've ever seen in my life. And I won't break it to you here, but it's one of the worst liars I've ever seen in my life. And we, you just look at her and go, isn't that cute? You really believe that people think you're telling the truth. So you just hit on something that I've told, I don't know how many people about you guys in the behavior panel, which is when I first started watching the videos, it looked like I was watching magic because you would play the clip, then you would all break it down. Then you play the clip again. The second time I watched the clip, I go, this is so obvious. This is like looking behind the curtain of a magician because he he just explained the trick to you. But if you don't have the knowledge or the experience and you don't know what to look for, it may as well be magic, right? Do you guys get that? Yeah, yeah, for sure, John. I'll tell you that the best compliment I ever get is not intended as a compliment. When I read a review of my book and people say, I knew all that, I'm like, good. I'm glad you did. (laughs) Because it should be that digestible. What we're talking about, I believe that human beings were were wired originally to communicate non-verbally. If you look at us, there's still residuals from that. For example, everybody knows what this means. That's nonverbal communication. And I think yeah. we have blunted it over the years. If you go back and look at 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 600 years ago, and you find all these proverbs, like the eyes of the windows to the soul, or lots of thin, they'll talk about people being a lily-livered liar, meaning white, pasty, thin lip lies. Those kinds of things all are, we all know, we all use in body language, but they were used in common vernacular centuries ago. So it's interesting. I think we've turned off a lot of this because of politeness. But yeah, it, it should be something that when you read it and you look at it, you go, yeah, I get that. I know that. I knew that. And you, you mentioned earlier about the body language. You mentioned when you're looking down into the right, right? That's that's more emotion, right? Yeah, almost always. Yeah, you know, There are exceptions and we have to base usually, line, But yeah, it's, usually. And though. if you if you don't believe that, just for a minute, stop and think about, I'm going to ask you to think about something negative. So just beware. Um, think about the last funeral you went to and watch your own eyes. They'll drift down yeah. into your right as you think about that person. And it's, it does on positive things as well, but negative things are so strong in humans that it's easy for you to draw that up. So when I watched back some of the videos that I've created myself, I typically kind of like this conversation. I mean, I've got some note cards that take notes, but I, I don't have an outline or a bunch of questions that are scripted. And so I noticed when I was editing some of my own videos, I noticed my eyes kept going up and to the right. Is that mm-hmm. like creating? So, what you know, there's Myers, or Myers-Briggs. Um, NLP years ago came up with this thing around eye movement and said, hey, here's what this means and here's what that means. I don't think any of it is hard coded like that so that everybody looks this way. What you have to do is ask questions. So, for example, I'll give you one, John, and you can answer this question and let your eyes do what they do. And every all of you, listen to this and try it yourself. What's the fifth word of the Star Spangled Banner? There you go. Ding, ding, ding. See that? So what we know is that a person's going to go to a place in their head for information. You just went slightly up and to your left between your brow ridge and your cheekbone, which okay. I typically see in people when I ask that question or similar question about auditory memory. Now, NLP would say that's hard-coded. I don't think that's true because you can get different answers from different people. So what you do is you ask the right question so that the person will have to dig for information. If I say okay. what color is your hair, that's easy. You don't have to think. But what you do in, in that case, because it's a fairly complex question, is you listen to the words, oh, say, can you? And then you start trying to count as you go down to your left in that internal voice. So what we know is you can, it's baselineable. And we actually, Scott and I were working before COVID hit with the University of Louisville. We're going to go back and get some MRI studies done at the same time we're doing eye movement. And 
I've got some MRI studies. I think I showed them at, at the event, boom, 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 showing you pictures of what part of the brain lights up when you're talking, when you're thinking. What we're after is a baseline, not what everybody does, but what you specifically do. So, the, so it sounds like the art and the, and the science in it is peppering in those questions that don't sound like you're interrogating. That's right. But they're establishing the baseline for the different. It may be the eye movement. It may be something else, but you're that's right. Yeah. And that's okay. a contrived question, for example. That's a contrived question. I use that right. one. Nobody would ever go up and say, hey, what's the fifth word of Star Spangled Banner? Right. But if you knock on the door of a CEO's office and you walk in and they've got, I call it, I love me well, they got all their stuff on the back. They got <laughs> pictures of a, of a golf course. Well, you, we all have them. Mine's back over here in the corner somewhere. But if you, if you go and you look at, the, um, at what they have on their wall, and let's say they have a golf course and it's hole 18 at somewhere, all you have to do is say, hey, where's that golf course? That's pretty cool. That sounds like normal conversation. And the guy goes, well, it's St. Andrews on the 4th of July. Now you just baselined him. You got where he goes right. for visual memory. And now you ask another question. Hey, when last week when we were in that meeting, um, Bob said, I can't, and he goes, pulls it up and you get his auditory memory. Now when you see any deviation from that, you know something's up. Not always deception. In some right. cases, it's trying to characterize how to give you the words. In some cases, it's outright deception. In some cases, it's hedging percentages. When I taught salespeople, I would always say, when you ask a person a number, and instead of going here or here, they go here, they're hedging and they're calculating a percentage to tell you so they can hide Ooh. part of the money from you it, that they have in budget. So th this is all great stuff. And you're, you're making me think, so just for those of you that missed the event, it was three days with all four of these guys. So. Greg has so much more to share. So one of the things I'm curious about, you mentioned some stuff where you alluded to some specific tactics that would be great to dive or deep on. Obviously, you know, we don't have the time to do that here. If you could just recommend one of your books or, or a couple of your books as a starting point, specifically for some of the things that you were just talking about, like how do I know how to pick the right questions to start getting at a baseline and then what to do next? Well, a couple of things. I, I have more than one book. I've got 10 altogether. But the first one is Liar. And when you write your first book, the beautiful thing is you don't know if you'll get a second book. So you're very broad. So that okay. Liar book you have is broad. It gives you a lot okay. of intro to what I do. And now, then if you that... want more specific, that's the one you have, How to Spot a Liar. Yep. This one. And that's okay. a revised version. That's a revised version. I changed it okay. because I wrote that book in 2005 or 2004. And social media has changed so much of how humans interact that I had to update the book. So I did it a few years yeah. ago. The other one that I think a lot of people may or may not like, hold on one second. This is, this is a business specific book, the most dangerous business book you'll ever read. Yep. And I couldn't have written that book when I was 35, 40 years old because I didn't have 20 years of business experience. That's based on everything I learned from working with special operations guys, polygraphers, hostage negotiators, um, spy catchers, interrogators, and Green Berets, things that I learned from them that have application in business. And I always say, those guys couldn't write that book either because they know what they know and you have to merge the two. So for me, for example, team building, I'll just give you one example. There's a real commonality in all Green Berets and that commonality is not inborn, it's created. So you have to go through an assessment and selection process just to be able to go into training. Once they go through that, then they get into training, they go through, they learn all this stuff, then they get to go out and they become part of a team. Well, there's a lesson in there, and I'm not going to go into all the details. There's a great lesson in there about rites of passage. When you bring a person in on your team today and you don't create a rite of passage, they're just another person you put on the team. But for example, if you make everyone who comes on your team give a presentation about something very complex, very difficult the first time, so they can explain they can show you what they don't know about the company so you can help target. You're creating a rite of passage that everyone goes through and they bond better. It's fraternities do it, all kinds yes. of folks do it. So it's just, that's just one example and there's a lot more to that than I'm talking about. But that business yeah. lessons that I, I could not have learned in the business world and could not have expressed when I was 38 and got out of the army or is what that book is about. Great. Well, I wanna respect your time. We've only got a few minutes left here. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that are, are they're, they're not exactly about communication skills or anything specific to accountants, but I, I think it's always good to find out a little bit um, sort of outside the box uh, about guests when we have them on. Um, so if, if I were to come, you're just outside of Atlanta, you said? Correct. So if I were to come to your town and we were to go out to dinner, 
and you wanted to take me someplace where that's the only place I'm going to find whatever that thing is they're known for that's like the best, where would we go? Hmm, interesting. I, because I live on the outskirts, of course, uh, that's a difficult one in terms of where would I take you for food. I would probably take you somewhere into Madison, Georgia. Um, there's a little place there. Um, that's miles from my house, but a small place there that is an older place and it, the food's good in general. I, I wouldn't say there's a specific thing. If you're asking me where to take you that would be unique, I would say if you were to go to Columbus, Georgia, it's barbecue. And barbecue is a Southern thing, very Southern thing. If you've never been to barbecue places, everyone is different. Everyone has a secret spice. And there are a couple in that town that are fantastic. That's my original hometown. Yes, but bar barbecue is a big thing here. I live, I live yeah. just outside of Charlotte. So oh, yeah, we have yeah. the wars between North Carolina and South Carolina. It, it took me a while to understand even that barbecue was a very specific thing. It's not putting meat on a grill. It's that's not the grilling. grill. Yes, that's grilling. Grill, yeah. That's very different. Yeah, exactly. Well, now that's that's. I just talked to somebody last week who said I don't understand why I did not appeal to a jury very well, and she was an expert witness. And she said, you know, I went down there and I was talking to them, and I said, you all, and I said, ding, failure number one. You're in South Georgia. You don't say you all. That sounds like you're trying. Y'all, y'all. So, it, but barbecue in, in that area, I, and the main reason I would say go is not because of the food specifically, because it can be very close from restaurant to restaurant, but every place has nuance. There's a place there called Countries that's been there for 50 years. Great little place, lots of nuance, bluegrass music, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would pick a certain place and say nobody else can do this. So, yeah. What is your take? And I've gotten different answers on this. What is your take on the difference between y'all and all y'all? You know, it's funny. I think it depends on the area you're from. That's why all y'all wouldn't wouldn't occur, would not occur where I'm from in Georgia. Now, my parents are from deep South Georgia, deep South. I'm talking getting close to the Florida line, and they would never have imagined saying all y'all. Of course, culture changes things, and people move here. They may do it as a joke to say not y'all, but all y'all, meaning people that you know, everybody, all your friends. Usually, that precedes some kind of really direct harsh comment though i was just gonna say that's a distinction i heard in two different people that i asked was yeah. one was y'all is a smaller group all y'all is a bigger group the second answer i got was if i'm saying all y'all it's it about to good. get ugly yeah. yeah exactly yeah very different message yeah. same words yeah. to, to your point about you know culture context all, all that good stuff yep. um all right one last question and then uh, i'll ask you if you can tell us where everybody can find you your books and everything else sure if you can give me one question to ask another guest on a future show, what, what question would you want to ask? What, what's what your, would be a good what, question? Yeah, what drives you? What's your drive? Drives. What's your primary drive in life? Because if you ask me that question, I'd say understanding why people do what they do. That you just hit on one of one of mine, your primary drive. Yep. Great. Greg, where, where can we find you? Where can people I, find? I'm really easy to find at readbodylanguage.com. And if you go there, you'll see everything I'm tied up in, whether it's speaking or consulting or, you know, doing things for lawyers. And there's some free stuff out there. You can find free courses that Scott and I put together. You can find uh, the behavior panel. Please find the behavior panel. I think you'll have fun. I, in my opinion, it's my best hour of the week, most weeks, putting that show together. And then you'll also find some other things that are, you know, you can buy, you can find all my books and everything on the page. What about the course? Uh, body, the body Language, language Tactics course? Tactics, yeah, yeah, you can get links there. So bodylanguagetactics.com okay. is, is a place that Scott and I have put together subscription courses. There's some, there's an intro course that you can link to on my page and go there that's free. It's, you know, it's a few short courses to give you a feel for what we do. We mm -hmm. also have the True Crime Workshop. If you're a fan of true crime, which a lot of people are, then this will tell you how to decode. The only thing you'll hate is you'll know who did it very quickly when you're watching the show. <laughs> so for all of the, those of you listening and watching, one of the things that I love most about Greg, his material and all his partners in crime, they're very good at taking all their years of knowledge and experience and making it very simple to understand and giving you ideas on how you can actually apply it to your own life. So it's not just a story that you hear, that's just entertainment. It is entertaining, but there's also skills that you can pick up there. So for me, that was my big pull to you guys' content and the reason that I, I really like following all the stuff that you guys put out. So with that, Greg, thank you very much for your time and very generous with it. Maybe down the road, we could do this again. I could talk to you all day, but I want to respect your time as well as our audience. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up and we will see you guys next time.